Okay, I'm playing the song from St. Elmo's Fire because a sketch that Robin and I wrote that was very popular. At yes. the like, tell everyone the title of the sketch we wrote together. St. Elmo's Breakfast Club. <laughs> and we it is, right there. One of all those movies. It and says I, it all right uh, there. Demi, Demi Moore. I was inspired by Demi Moore, even though I wore a blonde wig. Why I wore a blonde wig, I don't know. And my whole thing was everybody we would establish like a group of five mismatched friends yes. <laughs> and it was miss Yvonne, lynn stewart she Phil played Hart, the ali sheedy character she played the crazy composite, kanka. Yeah. kanka yeah kanka. <laughs> and phil hartman played the sort of older aging jock who was still friends with the high school kids yeah you played what did you play? I was sort of, I, I remember I had an athletic sweatshirt. I think I, I think I was supposed to be the athlete. And oh, you were, was, he was, the he was like the Judd Nelson angry rocker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I said, I was the athlete because again, I always, I, you know, this is how I sold Son of the Beach was, I, I always say like, ugh, and I, you know, you're not born without a, with a body like this. And I lift up my shirt. Of course, I have this horrible, skinny, paunchy body, but it always got a laugh. Which is, again, then I went on to sell Son of the Beach with that same joke. Um, but uh, that was a, I, I don't know. I remember when we first got together, Robin, you came up to me. I was like, hey, you want to write a sketch together? I was like, uh, yeah, sure. And we we came up with St. Elmo's Breakfast Club. And it was very funny because it just like says it all right there in the title. Like, you know exactly what this sketch is going to be. And everybody stepped forward and would do monologues and Yes. My, I think my monologue was something like, because um, I was, my whole job was, I was the pretty girl. Yeah. That was my That's character. It. And, yes. it was like, and it was the pain of being pretty. The pain of being pretty. And it was like all the pressure I was under. Friends, straight A's, everybody <laughs> right. wanted to go out with me. Right. Was, I forget what it was, the, the, the pressure of being the um the popular Most popular pretty yeah every three days you don't understand what i go through uh yeah every character in that sketch was just more ridiculous than the other ending with lynn who was like the deranged girl the ali sheedy character who kept crying because her mouse had gotten into a pile of coffee grounds and then got all the caffeine made the cat mouse go in a wheel and, and run itself to death. <laughs> I didn't remember that. But when, you know, when you and I were in the groundlings, Tim, we had a lot of writers, people who went on to be writers. And I honestly think that we had in, in just in terms of material, we had some of the best material that I've ever seen in the groundlings. Yeah. And I think, and Tom Maxwell, our director at the time, went on to become a writer as well. And yeah. I think you're right. It was very, I don't know. I have not been to the Groundlings in so long. I should go. But you're right that it was much more sketch oriented than it was improv oriented, if that makes any sense. I think. We had, we ha would have different amounts of sketches i mean of improv right. like sometimes we had a second act didn't we or a lot of the second act that was improv but a lot of times it was just yeah or sort of a an extended scene like another version of bill stein kellner's instant yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a shorter version of that like we would improvise a it would be a 20 minute improvise but tom would run blackouts and you know right, right. so yeah. he was sort of writing it directing it as we went through this improv yeah you know, and setting, and setting up scenes and stuff like that. But, you know, the Groundlings, I got involved in the Groundlings. I was already writing. I didn't have any ambitions to be an actor. And I was depressed. I was had writer's block. I was writing movies at the time. So I was by myself all the time. And I was depressed. And my shrink is like, I want to put you on meds. And at the time, 
it was before everyone in California was on meds. So I was like, no, I'm going to. Hey, what sounds so bad about that? <laughs> I'm going to be a zombie. And then she's like, well, you know, maybe you'll join a charity or get involved in a sport. And I'm like, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and I used to go see the Groundlings. I used, you know, when it was Paul Rubens that's and John Paragon, Phil Hartman, Cassandra Peterson, Phyllis Katz, just Edie McClurg, all these that's amazing that's people. And I always thought that looked like fun. And so on an impulse at the end of a groundling show, I stopped by the box office and I asked about classes and he said, oh, there's a basic class starting soon, basically. And um, I decided to do it. And that's how I got involved in the groundlings. And the first time I got a laugh, I was like, must have more laughs as soon as possible. <laughs> It really is true. It's just so addictive. And, 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 and I'm still good friends. You know, I'm still good friends with a lot of people from yeah. that time in my life. And I learned so much about writing and got more confident in my own writing. I just learned a lot. Yeah. No, it's really true. And, and it also forces you to be sort of a comedy capitalist where, you know, at the Groundlings, if you want stuff on stage, you better write it. You better come up with material. And that that's why when Robin said you want to write a sketch it was like, and we got that thing on and it became a very popular sketch for a short period of time. We also wrote um, together a, an industrial film, which was a very weird experience. Robin, tell everyone what an industrial film is. It's a company calls you uh, <laughs> to make a film. Is it for their employees or is it an advertisement or I what is that one? I, I, I did a few because Dave Morgison, who you might know, used to hire a lot of groundlings to do industrial shows, but most of them were live. You go to conventions and then you're getting drunk with the people that work at the company. But we only did a couple of industrial films, but one of them, I think it was, it was called, it was terrible. It was called, It's a Wonderful Bank. Yeah. It's a Wonderful Life, but It's a Wonderful Bank, which of course the villain in the movie is a bank. It, and it's a wonderful <laughs> life, but not this bank. <laughs> this bank loves people. <laughs> this so, was the hero bank. Yeah. So somehow we got, Robin and I got hooked in by Tom Maxwell, who I think directed this brilliant piece of film. Um, and the premise was, it was about a bank. You could get credit insurance like no, it's not life insurance. It's credit insurance. That was like a big part of the movie where one of our characters grab like what you can get credit in like it's like life insurance, but it's for your mortgage. And this was going to save people and it becomes it's a wonderful bank. Um, but we wrote that. And I just remember um, this is a compliment to you. I remember you had a little house in West L.A. Like, yeah. Which was also impressive. I think I was still in an apartment at that point. Maybe I, yes. Yeah, I think it was the, I, a rental on Barrington. Yeah, but I thought that was impressive. Um, and she's got a car that's been paid off. <laughs> You're really, really obsessed with the fact that I my car was paid off. Oh, so then still am. Still keeps me up. But here's what I also remember about you at that time. You knew how to use a computer. Oh, yeah. You understood DOS. And I remember you kept saying, I would like pitch a joke or you would pitch a joke. And say, I'm going to put that in scrap. And I had. <laughs> <laughs> no, what? what is scrap? It was probably an old it K -Pro. Gone on me. It was probably a gigantic old K-Pro. I, I bought a K-Pro from Jake Hogan that was portable because the hard drive was bolted down so oh you could God. take it with you but it was like 60 pounds it was <laughs> like a gigantic it. suitcase <laughs> that might have been it but i do remember thinking at the time like she's got her car paid off were you smart this is my quote leads to this question were you smart in high school you know that's a funny question but i was i this was like a traumatic thing for me i there, I took a test. It was like an aptitude test. And I think it was in junior high. And I was told that I tested borderline 
between the smart kids and the average kids. <laughs> Why you would tell this to someone in middle school and, you know, color my whole life. So I, um, in high school, I was given a choice. Do I go into honors classes and, or the classes of the average kids? And I chose average kids. I did not want to. So I got straight A's, but I don't know. I have a certain kind of brain. Like I tested horribly. I tested so low on my SATs. I I wouldn't get in anywhere now with my SAT scores. Right. At the time, they just let you into UCLA if you were in California, basically. Is that where you went to college? Yeah. Okay. But I studied history. I didn't get a degree in writing or acting or anything. I did history. Right. Because I would have thought you were smart. I don't know. Mo again, most groundlings are, you know, barely, you know, they, they barely graduated high school. A lot of kids went to college, but they're just not known for their academics. And I remember thinking at the time, watching you work on this computer, like, oh, my gosh, she's so smart. She knows about scrap. Whatever, uh, whatever. A long time to appreciate that I was smart because I am smart in the way I'm smart. But yeah. I, like I said, well, I have a younger brother who, you know, on the SATs, he got like 1580 and, you know, he was like the, he was in all the honors classes and went to Stanford and Harvard law school. And I think I remember him now. Yeah. Tom. So um, you know, that was the environment that I grew up in. So I was just this sort of creative one that, you know, over yeah. there. Because that's that's that is the status quo with the groundlings, is most of the kids, although you were probably not a show off in high school. I was a, you know, like whatever I could do to get a laugh in class. So I would do I was badly behaved oh, and good. a straight A student. So like I would mouth off in class. That's um, fun. But I was a straight A student. So what could they do? Right. That's interesting. That that's that's uh, unique. Um, OK, we're coming up on our second break uh, again. This seems to be going great. Uh, I, think so. I think so. I think the reviews are flying in. Um, I'm talking to Robin Schiff, longtime writer, producer, uh, Romy and Michelle's high school reunion, among other things. But we'll also watch Lover Boy because I remember when that when you sold that, I kept thinking, again, it's like, oh, my God, you sold a movie like Lover Boy. It's and it's a, and it's a funny movie. It's an absolute funny movie. It was very popular with 14 year old boys. Like right. if you meet somebody who was around 14, 15, 16 at the time, they really loved it. But should I tell you how that movie came about? Sure. Uh, Do we have I time or should we pick it up on the other side? Yeah, we got time. Go. Um, I was friends with this guy named Jeff Sagansky, who was an executive at NBC at the time. Oh. And he liked to hear about all my sexual exploits. He was not, he wasn't a prude. He was just a guy who wasn't getting a lot of action. And he liked to hear about my sexual exploits. Wow. And was a, a guy in one of the Groundlings classes who was a very good improviser, not particularly good looking, took off his shirt one day and I'm like oh he's got a really nice body whatever it was guy was 10 years younger than I was which isn't that bad except I was, on. <laughs> I was 29 so he was 19 years old I had one of those too at the groundlings keep going <laughs> but um so I tell Jeff Sagansky about this and I said he's a really unlike he's a he's great in bed but he seemed like a really unlikely lover and I said, it would it would be funny if there's a kid who nobody thinks would be a good lover. He's home for the summer and he starts sleeping with all his mom's friends at the country club for money. <laughs> and that would, you know, so I say this at dinner. No, it wasn't a pitch. It was wow. just whatever. The guy, this guy, Sagansky, gets made president of TriStar Pictures, calls me up says, would you write that? He called it Boy Gigolo. Would you write that Boy Gigolo movie? And um, there was about to be a strike. This was in 84, I think. Right. And um, and he's, and there was about to be a strike. So I said, if you can close my deal and pay me before the strike, I'll do it. 
they make the deal, they close the deal, the strike never happens. And now I'm stuck writing a movie about a, like a, a, a comedy about a young male prostitute. It started really depressing me. And I was like, how can I write this movie? It's so dark, you know? And um, I was actually ended up being fired off the movie and rewritten. And because um, I had other stuff in it that I felt made it about something and they promptly took all that out. Yeah. Well, it's fun. It's fun. If people are looking Patrick Dempsey, <laughs> young Patrick, Dem young 19 year old Patrick Dempsey looks nothing like he looks now. I think he's got, he got a nose job. He looked yes. super skinny and super geeky looking. Yeah. He was a geeky kid. And now it's, it's yeah, cute. it was cute. Uh, okay. We got to take that break. You're listening to it's radio with TV's Tim stack. And we'll be right back. 